Some breaking news now on Talk TV, and it is actually in regard to Israel. It's the decision of the Israeli military, and presumably Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister as well. Uh, the Israeli military, the IDF, has withdrawn all ground troops from southern Gaza, apart from one brigade. Uh, the IDF has withdrawn all ground troops from southern Gaza Strip overnight after four months of fighting in the Khan Yunus area, that's in the south of, uh, of Gaza. Only one brigade remains and is tasked with securing the Netrazim corridor that divides the Gaza Strip. Well, we'll get into that uh, with Ehud uh, Barak, who we're going to talk to a bit later on, the former Prime Minister of Israel. He is calling for Benjamin Netanyahu to go. There are a number of people uh, in Israel who are doing so as well. Many people want an election uh, in Israel. There is a, a, a loose and, and very fractious coalition running, a war cabinet essentially running Israel at the moment. And Benjamin Netanyahu, of course, is a, a character and a major political figure who's been there for a very, very long time. And uh, getting rid of him politically would be a major change in Israel. Of course, there have been lots of other prime ministers at various stages, but he has been around for a very, very long time. And of course, the way he is perpetrating the war in Gaza has been subject to a huge amount of criticism, not just in Israel, but around the world as well. Um, on that note, we are talking uh, for a long time in this programme today, a, a, a substantial portion of the programme, which I think is absolutely right, because we are six months today. Today is the anniversary of the 7th of October Hamas terrorist attacks. Um, I'm delighted that in the studio we have Irene Abraham from the Institute of Economic Affairs. Hello. Hello, Lovely to see you. how are you? Very well, thanks. And Matthew Laza, who's a former Labour advisor. Good to be with you. Um, and quite a number of stories going around. I want to bring this back to the UK here because there's a survey by the Henry Jackson Society, which is a counter-extremism think tank, that says that only one in four British Muslims believe that Hamas committed murder and rape in Israel on the 7th of October. I mean, that is, that is factual. 46% um, of British Muslims said they sympathise with Hamas, according to this poll. These are astonishing figures, Matthew. Yeah, I mean, I think that they are uh, shocking figures. In fact, there's also shocking figures within this uh, survey that uh, people in the non-Muslim British population, uh, uh, the, the figures are surprisingly high, much lower, but surprisingly high on various of the questions uh, that they asked. Like, um, I think it was a, 9%, a, a significant percentage wanted to see Sharia law who weren't Muslim themselves. 32%, yeah, yeah. Which, which I think is really interesting. I think it's I think what's interesting about that is the, the, the other statistics also. So uh, just uh, removing that from Hamas, they also said that 46% uh, of the UK Muslims uh, would sympathise with Hamas, but also 32% of UK Muslims want Sharia law implemented in Britain. I mean, that's very worrying. That, that is particularly worrying, and I, and I suppose it, I, I, I'm quite interested in uh, Henry Jackson Society's methodology and how they've actually uh, sort of tried to, to poll as many You always have to ask that question yes. with any, with any survey. Question. Yeah, How many um, people are they actually uh, polling for a example but also i mean no matter how the survey is done these are are shocking figures rain uh, absolutely shocking figures sorry to interrupt you matthew but no, I, think, no, I think it's i think it's absolutely shocking and if if true i think really quite worrying especially when it when we're sort of considering the way in which internal party politics has been playing out with regard to uh, the horrendous atrocities that are occurring over in the middle east i mean i do think actually just politically for the conservative party a lot of you know those backbench members of parliament that are a little bit more pro israel they're going to be looking at at the way in which politicians and you know, potential leadership candidates are going to be looking at this issue. Well, let's How... get into that right now. Just hold that thought for a second, Reem. I promise I'll come back to you. But I just want to look at a clip now of Oliver Dowden, who is the Deputy Prime Minister. He told uh, Sky News something which doesn't seem to quite accord with what Lord Cameron, the Foreign Secretary, is saying because he, uh, Lord Cameron, has a, a big article in the Sunday Times today where he is talking about Israel saying, look, our support is not necessarily guaranteed and it could be looked at at some point. Of course, this comes in the wake of those seven aid workers, including private security individuals who were uh, killed by an Israeli drone strike. There have been all sorts of uh, repercussions from that internationally, but also uh, within Israel, there have been military commanders and various people who have been dismissed as a result. It was a huge mistake and the chain of command was not properly followed. But let's have a look at what Oliver Dowden told Sky News a little bit earlier this morning. I think it's really fascinating in terms of the fact that even the cabinet of this country is not united in its view of Israel, I think. And holding, trying to hold Israel to incredibly high standards, of course it's right that we hold Israel to high standards, but and I just think there's a bit of relish from, uh, from, from, from some people about the way in which they are pushing this case against Israel. We should think back to how Israel was on the day of that attack. The trauma it's still suffering. Of course Israel has made mistakes and made big mistakes and we should hold them to account for that. 
but, but we are holding them to a very high standard. Is there a relish, um, Matthew, in the international yeah, I wouldn't community? Say it's, it, it, I wouldn't say it's a relish. I mean, look, uh, these comments came before the uh, the news we've had about the pullout uh, from the south of Gaza, yeah. which I think will have be an, a huge uh, a game changer internationally in terms of support. I mean, frankly, this has happened because the Americans have told them to do it um, and told them that their support w w was on the line. So they, they are listening to the international I think community they're, I think in, they're listening, in a way that they weren't previously. I think they're listening to Joe Biden, who has stepped, who has, who's made the demands a lot harder than he was previously, and Netanyahu sort of toyed with. Uh, ignoring the Americans and trying to pit himself against the Americans and, and that was disastrous at home politically in Israel where as you say the calls mm. uh, for an election are mounting but within the British cabinet I think there is a divide um, um, and I think that there is um, some pressure uh, on David Cameron. I mean Oliver Dowden is a natural supporter of David Cameron. They're from the kind of more liberal with a small L wing of the, of the Tory party uh, and if they are, are, are fighting each other then the sort of people like Suella Braverman who's been in Israel and has been absolutely 100% uh, uh, firm in her support of the Netanyahu government, not just mm. of Israel, but of the Netanyahu government, then I think there is a, a clear political divide in the Tories. Oddly, I mean, it's, 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 it, doesn't, it doesn't matter in the great scheme of things, but uh, it's been an easier week for Labour because everybody in Labour's united around the position about waiting to see the legal advice and seeing the, and wanting an, uh, uh, you know, and if, and if it continued down the trajectory mm. we were seeing, arms sales ending, thankfully. I think that would do, do you think arms sales should end to Israel, Matthew? No, and I, I don't think now, and I think that they, not with the, the not with this pullout from the south. I think we, we need we're seeing That's a calming the, is down. that a game changer? Do you think? I think it's a game changer for okay. for, for me, the, the, the Americans, and it would be a game changer for most people in the world. It absolutely is a game changer, isn't it? I mean, particularly because it shows that they are responding to yeah. the international community and not mm. entirely ignoring them. And I think what's interesting about this, and Matthew made this distinction between support for Israel and Israel's right to defend itself, and support for the Netanyahu government. I think that those two are very different things. Because ultimately, I think that most people are supportive of the Israelis, Israeli government's right to defend itself after October 7th. I think that many people have gripes and criticisms of the Netanyahu government, particularly, I mean, we can talk about their own internal politics. I mean, there really is a problem with some levels of extremism within Netanyahu's party, but also within uh, the ranks of, of the Israeli government. So I do think we can have questions about particular regimes, whilst also still believing that as a country, they have the right to defend themselves against Hamas terrorists. There is also an element of the fact that within the United Kingdom, within the Conservative Party, there is going to be this kind of litmus test for a new leadership election after the general election. Yeah. And I think that Israel-Gaza is going to be that okay. issue. Somebody like, and as you said, somebody like Oliver Dowden naturally would uh, quite like someone like David Cameron. They're One Nation Tories. They're sort of on the centre-right centre sort of left-ish of the party. Somebody like Penny Morden, somebody like Suella Braverman, and then somebody like... A Liz Truss or, or a Kami Badnock, those particular individuals are going to be tested by no. the very pro Israeli uh, Conservative MPs, and this is going to be that test. Let me just ask you another question about this survey. Now, this was carried out by JL Partners, who's a polling company uh, formed by James Johnson, the former Downing Street pollster. It's a very reputable uh, company, and they follow all the guidelines. I can't see just how many people they've actually uh, surveyed. I can't see that in the, the uh, research that's in front of me. Maybe we can find that out, actually. But this was for a counter extremism think tank, the Henry Jackson. Society. What I'm worried about, well, there's, I'm worried about the whole thing, to be honest. Among British Muslims, 41% said that Jews have too much power in the media industry, that old anti Semitic trope, and 39% said Jews have too much power in the UK's financial system. Also, with younger people, younger and well educa yeah. educated Muslims are most likely to think Hamas did not commit atrocities on October the 7th, with the proportion rising to 47% among 18 to 24 year olds and 40% amongst the university educated. I mean, they're ignoring the facts. Uh, that's what Matthew. really stands out. That's absolutely uh, uh, shocking statistics. I mean, uh, I mean, it's not just uh, on the media that, people, that British Muslims say that Jews have too much power. 46% uh, think they have too much power over UK government policy. I was actually shocked that it was 16% of the general public of the, uh, of the non-Muslim sample as well, which frightens me as well. Uh, but clearly, I think the fact that it's the uh, more educated uh, cohort of British Muslims uh, 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 that are more likely to believe well, this. Well, they're not educated really about what Hamas did exactly. in Israel. Exactly, and we must remember uh, this, is the six, uh, this is the sixth anniversary today uh, of those shocking attacks. So I think this is, this is uh, just, it's, it's incredibly worrying and it's also incredibly depressing. Um, um, uh, I mean, particularly the fact that people with, deg with degrees yeah. um, uh, are, are, you know, are 40% are of them uh, think that this happened. It's just, it's, uh, I don't know, it just, it, it, sometimes it just makes you despair, doesn't it? I don't know what we do. I don't think there is yeah. an easy answer. Well, I mean, what's interesting is, so this was uh, in, in the Telegraph today and 
they sort of spoke about the, the the fact that this has a problem with social cohesion. That actually the fact the fact that there are a sect of Muslims, and I don't believe it is all Muslims, and maybe this poll is is representative of all of them. They're not representative of the people that I know. But well, it's certainly. If, I mean, it is a representative it is a rep sample by a, a by, by, by a polling, polling company, company that we standards, trust. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll find out the numbers. We'll, so maybe Chris, the producer, can can try and find out how many people they actually survey. We'll, we'll find out the numbers, and, and I'm, I'm also interested in them in their methodology. But either way, if this is true, it is incredibly worrying. And I think what's interesting is the Telegraph article does emphasise the problem with social cohesion. This idea that there is a sect of people in this country, a large sect of people in this country, that want Sharia law implemented as as within our government institutions, I think is particularly worrying. But that's itself. what's particularly shocking is the fact that the the, 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 the better educated sample is 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 more mm -hmm. sceptical um, and, and plain wrong. Well, it's because we've seen things about separate and equal communities that we've seen in northern towns where um, uh, there are you know issues about uh, sort of segregation. Uh, but what we haven't, but normally we're thinking that going to university is one of those things that is about integration. Yeah. It is mm -hmm. about people being open to new and different ideas and different people. So that's what's okay. depressing, most depressing. Well, there's quite a few things I want to talk about today and we are talking a lot about Israel over the cool. course of the programme but I've just received information from Chris the producer that a thousand British Muslims were uh, interviewed for this so this is this is a representative sample, sample yeah. and over two thousand general public in this and of the general public in the study as well so I think we can believe those statistics and um, certainly that's a, a reasonable yeah. sample size. That makes it ever similar. more depressing. <laughs> well it, it does doesn't it? Um, I mean um, a thousand British Muslims that's I mean, again, a standard, that's that's a standard, standard sample, standard sample it's, size. It's a, yeah it's a standard sample size but again I do I, I would like to see what this would look like for example within a general election vote or, or within yep. you know within that's the your afternoon reading room to go and read all the tables afternoon reading yes and I'd, I'd quite like to look at the, the methodology okay. I, but yeah it is it is a standard sample that it's sure doing. okay um uh, here at home as well the uk apparently according to the former defense secretary Ben Wallace and the former Armed Forces Minister James Heapy, he's just stood down recently. Britain has failed to prepare itself for war as a whole nation endeavour. Uh, this is a stark wake-up call to the government. This is two weeks after leaving office. The uh, Conservative MP and former Army Officer James Heapy urging ministers to prepare for conflict. He called them to put plans in place for commandeering land for cultivation to feed the nation, requisitioning consumer electronics for weapons, backed by Ben Wallace, who said there are too many people in the government relying on hoping that the current instability would go away. How unstable are things, Reen? Well, this is the question, right? I mean, ultimately, the fact that a former defence minister is saying this and also saying that we need to be redrawing and dusting off uh, those those government war books during the Cold War, I think it does sort of uh, point towards the idea that we are not defending ourselves correctly. And we are also not spending enough on defence, if part of it is money, but also part of it is technological advancements. You know, we how much how much of these security threats are coming from boots on the ground versus what we have now which are cyber attacks you know economic warfare uh, things happening online and a little bit more difficult to track rather than boots on the ground and the no. threat of physical threats. Marcy how scared should we be how much preparation should we put into this? Well I think we should be concerned and I think one of the things that really concerns me is that um, after sort of little flurry when the Ukraine war started um, and we sort of thought we were getting on a war footing as in there's conflict in Europe and that impacts our politics, that impacts our spending choices for government, that impacts us with our gas bills. It sort of became basically all about gas bills and electricity bills, which were important, not important, but not. But we haven't had politicians saying that if we've got a war in Europe, it's going to cost money. Uh, well, we've had Grant Shapps, the defence secretary, yes, calls, had, calling for a lot more money. We've had a lot of defence figures. We've, I mean, this is a debate that's gone no, no, it's on a debate that's for some, we haven't some had, time. What we haven't had is the, is the Prime Minister, um, and frankly, we haven't had it from the leaders of the other parties as well, saying, you know, people want X, Y and Z spending on other things, on social services in the broadest sense, uh, uh, but actually we're going to be living in difficult, uh, in more difficult times. Show me the politician who says we haven't got enough money to spend on defence. I mean, defence of the realm is the yeah. number one issue. And Rishi Sunak, in fairness to him as Chancellor, said that he has funded the but defense, nobody people are saying that the defence forces. Hold on, Sorry. the defence forces to a, a much larger degree than previously, and that is something that that he says he you know stands over his record as Chancellor. But people are saying they're going to go up to two and a half or three percent. They're not talking about the fact that you know we may all have to put up with higher bills for a long time we may all yeah. have to put up with five percent of this we may not be able to do xyz so i think what we need is that debate i think that these ex-defense ministers need to be careful about sort of saying that we need to be, be digging up our gardens to, to grow vegetables just yet i think sometimes the rhetoric used is a little bit over the top and so it turns people off for what is actually a very important debate we need is to it have. a bit too doom and gloom i do i do think i well i mean this is it i do i do think saying things like you've got to dig up your gardens and and, and, and grow some vegetables i think just fuels those kind of 
slightly conspiratorial, slightly more radical people that, that will believe those things and, and then do it and then act, act irrationally. I do think we need to have a very serious conversation about how much we're spending on defence. And also, I mean... How much should we spend on defence, Reem? Well, I think the, the, the NATO commitment is, is right, and I, but I do think that it's about where that money goes. Matthew brings up this excellent point, actually. We're talking about public spending. It's got to be talking... About, uh, we've got to talk about defence spending in the context of wider public spending. You know, people are going to talk about how much we spend on public services, on the NHS, and I would argue that the solution to a and lot of And that's the bit we haven't heard. We've heard the bit about people saying, oh, yes, defence spending is a good thing. But where's we the heard money about where the coming from? Exactly. exactly. And, I, and I suppose you've got to have this conversation. Do you want a higher tax bill, or do you want more money for your NHS? I had this exact debate with somebody well, very People recently. don't want to choose. They want everything. But no, but this is Especially it. when they're paying such high tax. The question itself is wrong. Saying, do you want a better NHS, or do you want more money for public services? Is, is that, that's, that's a wrong question to be asking. The NHS doesn't need to be better. It doesn't improve as a result of more money. We've seen that, right? We've got spending just below £200 billion. Pounds it's, it's, as long as the money's spent right, it can as long be. But, but what we need to be thinking about is institutional reform, and then there can be more of that money in okay. the budgets to go to defence. Okay.